All right, so doors are closing, so I'm going to get started. Um, uh, my name is Ethan Gunderson, here to talk to you about um, understanding data storage. Uh, before I do that, though, I'd like to bitch a little bit about something. Um, and that would be NoSQL. I, I assume that everyone here has heard of the term NoSQL. I and mean, is there anyone that hasn't? Yeah, that's what I thought. Um, I actually think this is a really damaging term. Um, normal people don't talk like this. Um, we, don't, we don't group things together in a negative way. Um, and besides being completely negative, it's almost a completely worthless term at that. Um, saying that you're using a NoSQL database tells me absolutely nothing about what you're doing. Um, is it a key value store? Is it a, a graph database? I have no idea because you've just said NoSQL. Um, even worse is that now that we've classified this group of databases as one group, um, it gives the impression that they're interchangeable, um, which they're not. Uh, a graph database is not interchangeable with a key value store. Um, to help illustrate this point a little bit, um, what, if, what if we started saying no Greenland? Um, you know, it's Greenland, it's, but it's covered in ice, so it's confusing. Uh, I don't understand it. It doesn't scale, so no Greenland. <laughs> you know, so instead of saying, I'm, I'm from Chicago, it's the United States, I would say, I'm from no Greenland. Um, that could be Italy, Mexico, the States, Canada. It's all now one area of the world, although they're completely different. You're, it doesn't make any sense, does it? So. I would consider a personal favor if everyone in this room never said NoSQL again. The next time you go to say it, be like, hmm, maybe I could be more descriptive in what I'm trying to tell the person. So let's practice this a little bit. Redis is not a NoSQL database. It's a key value store. MongoDB is not a NoSQL database. It's a document store. Cassandra is not a NoSQL database. It's just difficult to use. <laughs> So that's the end of my rant. Um, so like I said, I would consider it a personal favor if you never said NoSQL again. So moving on. Like I said, I'm Ethan. I work at Optiva. Um, we're a small consultancy based out of Chicago. Um, more importantly, I like databases. I like reading about them, talking about them. Um, obviously, I'm here talking to you guys about them. Um, the, the problem is that databases are really complicated, and I'm just not that smart. Um, they have a lot of big words, a lot of theory. Um, people like go to school to learn about database theory, and I just like read about it at night. So it's it's really difficult. But somehow I fixed that problem because, like I said, I'm here talking to you now. Um, and so my solution was to start a user group in Chicago called Chicago DB. Um, the purpose of it is every month we read an academic paper, and then we talk about it, um, learn a lot. We invited a lot of smart people, you know, people smarter than me, so I could just leech knowledge from them. That seems to be a pretty effective plan if you're looking to do the same. Um, just surround yourself with smarter people, like be the dumbest person in the room, you'll learn really quick. So if you noticed, I, I, I saw a problem that I had and I found a solution for it. Uh, this is something that I think the Ruby community has a problem with as well. Um, and so we're clear on not talking about testing frameworks. Um, we all know we should be using RSpec, so that's, that's not an issue. Um, the main problem I'm talking about is we seem to always want to fixate on solutions before we recognize the problems that they solve. Um, we see this a lot with new gems. Um, someone high up in our community will, re will release a new gem and instantly a thousand code bases are using it um, without really understanding why this gem was released, uh, what problems it solved, uh, is the code even good? Um, we just, we jump immediately onto solutions. And the latest, uh, the latest uh, explanation or instance of this is databases. So this is a fixational website uh, for a database called BombDB. Um, its features are it scales, it's maintenance free, and it uses something that is not a SQL language. It also is way cooler than SQL, and it allows you to fire all your DBAs. Um, Oddly enough, these are things that I found on various other database websites. None of this is actually made up, um, which is kind of scary that people actually post this and people read it and believe it. 
So almost immediately after this is put up on the internet, um, thousands of people across the world say, I, I have to use this. This database will solve all of my problems. Um, and mostly because they think it's cool. Uh, the, the website tells them that it'll solve their problems, but I don't think they actually know what their problems are yet. So. So really, it's, it's not about picking a, te a technology because it's cool. Um, I mean, the data in your application is the heart of it. Without it, you're, I mean, you have nothing. Um, so really, it's about doing your homework. I think most of us would call ourselves responsible developers, and I th believe part of that is having at least a basic understanding of the tools that you use and recommend, and that should include databases. Um, and this knowledge should extend the bullet points of a website or the information in the readme. Some questions that you need to ask yourself are, what were the, des the design goals in mind? Um, are these the problems that they were trying to solve? Do I have those problems? Are they, are they similar to problems I have? Do they match up at all? And there are other things like, what's the data model? Uh, is it a key value store? Is it, is it, just a, is it a graph database? Um, can I model my data in a way that this, app, this database can be useful? Um, what kind of querying does it have? Um, is it only primary key lookups? Does it offer secondary indexes? Uh, what about ad hoc querying for uh, like business intelligence reports? Um, you know, those, those things, the databases you pick affect all of this. Um, so the more questions you can ask and answer up front, the better off you'll be in the long run. Um, so I gave a version of this talk earlier this week in Chicago, and on the train ride back, there was this, this poster for portfolio investment. And that its big thing was invest before, investigate before you invest. And that really resonated with me because, I mean, it's, it's true. So either way, you're, you're gonna invest time. You might as well be investigating beforehand so that you're investing in, in knowledge that will last you uh, through, beyond this project. <laughs> So investigate before you invest. It's true for stock portfolios and databases. So let's do a little investigation. Uh, so from here, if you have any questions or comments, um, go ahead and like shout them or whatever. I think this would be a lot more, this presentation would be a lot more useful to everyone if there was more discussion going around. Um, so if someone has a question, go ahead. If you can answer the question, go ahead. I definitely don't have all the answers, so if you do, that's cool. Um, so the main, thing, the main thing we're going to talk about is the Amazon Dynamo paper. Uh, this was published in 2007 by, obviously, Amazon. And it was, I think, probably one of the first papers to group together uh, a set of technologies that describes a distributed database. Um, so things like consistent hashing, vector clocks, gossip protocols, uh, hits and handoffs, they were all described in this paper. None of them are new. I mean, these things have been around for quite a while, but the Dynamo paper uh, described them in a very easy to read uh, way. And if you're interested in any of this stuff, REAC is a database, a public database um, developed by Basho uh, that implements the Dynamo system. Uh, because Dynamo is a proprietary Amazon database. So this is, normally how you would start out a database, right? You'd have one node with all your reads and writes going to it. Um, as your database gets popular, or your application gets more popular, you normally do something like that. You just, more RAM, you know, more CPU. Um, this uh, still isn't really ideal, right? If, if that goes down, you're hosed. You have no redundancy at all. So you would move maybe to something like this. You have a couple uh, replicas that you can distribute your reads across, and then you still have the one master that takes writes. Um, and that's still not ideal, because eventually it'll fail. You know, something will happen, your master will go down, and then your website's effectively down. No one can write data. Um, you still may, may be able to read it, but um, that's not all that useful. Uh, at this point, I think it's pretty common for people to go and look at maybe master-master replication or maybe some sort of sharding, um, but there are better solutions out there. And that's what the Amazon Dynamo paper will talk about. 
So the first technology would be consistent hashing. This is really the heart of the Dynamo paper. So in our, in our simplified version, we're going to have a hash function that you pass it a key for whatever key value you want to look up, and ours is just going to return an integer from 1 to 100. So from here, we can imagine just a ring, a ring space that contains all of our integer values. Um, from there, we could, uh, for all the nodes that we want available this cluster, we could map them into the ring. Um, this could be pseudo-random. Um, you could use the same hashing function to introduce them as well. Um, so now that we have our, our basic cluster set up, let's hash uh, Scott Ruby. This returns us 15 for our simple example. So our insert mapped into 15 uh, would place us there. So now our job is to find out what node this data would live on, which is actually really simple. Uh, we just walk this, the ring until we find the next available node. So in this case, the node that it lives on would be from key range 1 to 25. And then so on, the next node would grab the key range 26 to 50. So it's actually pretty simple and a, a, I think a really elegant solution. Um, this also makes replication. Wait, yeah. This makes replication pretty easy. Uh, we can simply keep walking the ring structure until we find the number of nodes needed to fulfill our replication requirement. So in this case, we find our canonical home and we go two more nodes to find replicas. So now we have durability in our system. So what this would allow for is, let's say you know, someone kicks the power cable on that node and it goes down. We can simply walk to the next node and find key range 1 through 50. So at this point, we have a pretty high availability system. As long as one node is up, we can uh, read and write data. Um, there, there is one flaw in this, which I don't know if maybe anyone picked up, but it's we go back and look, it's not too hard to imagine that one of these key spaces could be hotter than others. So if you have a really popular user on Twitter, like if Oprah was mapped into this, her key range would probably be really more, would obviously be more popular than mine. Uh, so the node that stored her data would be hotter. Um, you could solve this through what's called virtual nodes. And I think every, almost every um, database that implements the Dynamo system does virtual nodes. So what we would do in this case is split our key sp space up into equal chunks and then map those chunks to various um, nodes. Does that make sense to everyone so far? Any questions? All right. Do that again. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, wait. <laughs> okay, so I guess that was a bad example. Uh, so for the <laughs> so for the Oprah problem. Okay. Okay, that makes Right. 
Right. But it would be used in another data below on a single node because you can spread it out to all the replicas that have that data. Right. Okay. Makes sense. Um, so let's talk about some trade offs now. Um, we know that nothing comes for free um, except for all the drinks last night, apparently. So, uh, what exactly have we, we given up? So, we've, we've gone from a pretty brittle system to one with extremely high availability. Um, and the truth of the matter is, we, we basically dropped acid. Um, um, for those of, I mean, so we've all been basically raised on acid, right? Um, most relational databases. <laughs> Most relational database, or yeah, most relational databases implement ACID, um, at least to some extent. There are arguments whether or not they actually do. But for those of us who, who may not know what ACID is, so um, atomicity modifications um, are like an all-or-nothing type of deal. They either complete or they don't, and they don't leave anything in a, a half-modified state. Uh, consistency, so nothing in your transaction will violate the integrity of the database. Um, and kind of more importantly, your system rolls from one consistent state to the next. Um, it's never in an inconsistent uh, state, obviously. Um, isolation, uh, transactions can't uh, access data inside of other transactions. Um, Share nothing there. And then durability. So once it's, once it's written, once you commit it, it's there, um, even if you would, uh, turn the server off or kill nine a process, your data should still be there. Um, I think we can all agree, too, that these are desirable properties. If we could have all of these, we, we would want them right. Um, unfortunately, we can't. So the CAP theorem was theorized in 2000 by Eric Brewer and was published in 2002, I believe. Um, and so what this describes is three different uh, properties of which you can only have two at any given point in time. So the first is the client perceives that a set of operations occurred all at once. Um, all nodes are available for reading and writing. And operations will complete even if individual components are unavailable. Um, so, and so we're clear, partition, partition tolerance, you know, anytime a node can't communicate with the other cluster, we have a partition. Um, this would include extreme latency in the network as well. So if other nodes, uh, if it appears that the node is down, um, it's essentially down. So we've already kind of decided that we have, we have partition tolerance. Nodes can go down, we can still, fun the system still functions to a relative degree. So we know that we have a, a uh, at least a P in our, our two letters that we can pick. Um, and this is, really you would always want P. Um, any type of distributed system, you would never want weak partition tolerance. What's the point at that? So, um, so basically what we have here is high availability. So because of that, we can kind of infer that we have weak consistency. So at any, any point in time, our system is inconsistent from um, node to node. And that's, I mean, that's because since any node is capable of accepting a write, there could be times when they haven't like, properly synced up yet. So a node could have a different version of it, the data besides uh, the next node. Um, so the other option would be strong consistency and low availability. So in this case, we could do this by, um, sorry, just reading my notes. Uh, we could ensure this by ensuring, we can ensure this by saying that all of our replicas would need to uh, accept and acknowledge the right. So our, right, so a right comes in, the canonical home accepts it, and then we could get a higher consistency by blocking any more writes until the two replicas have accepted the write as well. Um, this would lower our availability as those nodes aren't available to accept the write anymore. Um, it would also be kind of slow too. So instead, um, since we no longer have an acid system, we have uh, a base 
which is the opposite of acid. Get it? <laughs> um, so so basic, basically available soft state eventual consistency. Um, the system appears to be working at all times, um, but it's not consistent, uh, and it'll maybe eventually become consistent, is base. So where ACID is very pessimistic and enforces consistency from transaction to transaction, base is more loose saying, and it'll eventually get there, so it's fine. So the, the next thing we'll talk about is read repairs. So since we have an eventually consistent system, um, it's possible for nodes to get out of sync with another, one another. So in this case, we have the canonical home and the two replicas, and we're gonna, read a, we're gonna do a quorum read. We want all three to, we wanna reach a quorum on the three uh, nodes. So we're reading Scott Ruby again. Getting three responses, uh, two are winning, and one is killing it. So that's not right, like we have one that's out of place, but since we've reached a quorum, we can simply update it. Um, we're, we're relatively safe enough to do that. This doesn't always work though. Uh, so in this case, every node has its own version of the data. Uh, awesome, winning, and killing it. Uh, so read repairs won't work. One kind of elegant solution to this would be something called vector clocks. So a vector clock is a, it's a partial ordering for events. So anytime a node uh, alters uh, the key, it'll increment its own count on the vector clock. So in this case, the node A, which is the canonical home, has updated the, the same key three times and that's replicated over to the, the obviously to the replica. Um, so everything's fine here. So where it gets interesting is when there's uh, partitions between the nodes. So uh, the first two writes were written and replicated successfully. The second one, or the third one, however, something happened and the canonical home didn't take that write. Instead, one of, its, one of the nodes downstream from it did. Um, so it incremented its own count so it's at A2, B1. Uh, this case, it's super simple. Uh, the main home can just see that it's a superset and pull it down. Uh, there's no, nothing special about that. The other option is to merge. So the same deal, uh, first two writes were done successfully. However, there was some sort of ne network glitch or hiccup. Um, the, the canonical home incremented its count by one, but so did the replica. So in this case, we could do one of two things. Um, one of them would be merging, which, so this was designed for Amazon shopping cart. So in their case, they would just merge. Um, if you ended up with more items in your shopping cart, that's, they'd rather have more than, than none. So makes sense for them. Um, in other cases, things that can't be resolved, or can't be merged, maybe because of your domain, um, then you would need to bubble this up to your application layer, and that would have to resolve the read conflict. Any questions or anything so far? All right. So hints and handoffs. Um, hints and handoffs are a pretty easy way to recover from node failure. So in this case, um, one node has, has gone down, so all the inserts for that key range are going to um, the next one down the line. When that node comes back up internally using um, different protocols, that secondary node simply informs the node when it comes back up what it missed. Um, pretty simple, right? Um, this is mostly done through gossip protocols. Um, so gossip protocols um, are a way for nodes to do inter-node communication. Um, like pseudo randomly and very often they'll communicate the state of the cluster with each other and also ask the current state. So um, our third node is saying, you know, node one looks down, and node two is informing the rest that it's gonna take, it's gonna accept that key range. Um, yeah. So are there any questions on, or questions or comments?
So I, I'm not sure how that would actually be implemented. Um, it might be like um, through a time span. So for at least a period of time, it will be accepting um, the extra key space. And then using, I would assume using the gossip protocol, if it was down for a sufficient length, it would rebalance the key spaces. Um, I could be wrong in that though, but. Any other questions? Or Yep. Yeah. Yep. You would still ensure that there was three replicas or whatever you tuned it to. Yeah. So that's that's Dynamo, Dynamo in a nutshell. Um, I'm pretty quick. Um, so by doing a little bit of investigation, we've you know we've learned about consistent hashing and vector clocks and gossip protocols, but we've also learned the problems they solve too. Um, and more importantly, we're learning what we're giving up in return for this type of power. Um, so in other words, we're, we're winning. So just some takeaways. Uh, investigate before you invest. Um, I, I really think there's power in that to every point in your technology stack, not just databases. Uh, choosing the right tool for the job. Databases aren't interchangeable. Um, don't, don't treat them like that. And more importantly, do your homework. Um, these papers are pretty, they're, I wouldn't say fun to read, but I mean, they are academic. So, unless if you like academic stuff. So, speaking of homework, I have some for you. Um, I have five papers and one blog. So, the first paper, COD's relational model. Um, it's the basis of relational theory as we know it. Um, and it's actually, it goes way more in depth than any relational database currently implements. I think it's important to understand what we're giving up before we give it up. I mean, we've already kind of decided that SQL sucks without fully understanding what SQL is. Um, cap and base papers. Um, the cap paper is extremely short but extremely dense. I think it's taken me months to actually comprehend what it's trying to tell me. Um, Amazon Dynamo, which is a, a great paper to read. I really enjoyed it. And then Big Table, which I didn't go over anything with Big Table, but it's another a paper that spawned quite a few databases. And then the blog is Werner Vogel's blog. He's the CTO of Amazon. I just discovered this blog, and I'm kind of disappointed I, I haven't been reading it the entire time. He does an excellent job of describing distributed systems in general. So. Any more questions? I have not heard of anything like that. That would be kind of cool, though. So if somehow, like, someone got a malicious node into your... I don't... I mean, I guess you could, you could write something into a gossip protocol for that. Like this one node has, you know, 900% more activity than any of the other ones. Um, I don't know for sure though. Any more questions? All right. Thank you.